Okay, here we go. Now it starts off with a scan of a, an old article from uh, uh, by uh, a Clairbout student, I believe, an old ar old article from uh, the Leading Edge, um, which is uh, the very journal that you're getting copies of as the uh, the Student uh, Geophysical Society. Okay, Leading Edge has all these great tutorial articles. The the research articles, you know, they usually appear in the journal called Geophysics that SEG publishes. Um, and they're they're of variable quality, you know. Depend, you know sometimes, sometimes geophysics takes in a uh, kind of lousy paper because it looks like it is quite useful, okay. Um, and and because it looks interesting, you know, they'll uh, uh, they'll take a paper that doesn't have a whole lot of examples. If you want to see tutorials and examples by really the 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 people who have invented some of the most popular methods. And uh, uh, and then you know, ten years after they invent them, they're asked to sit down by the leading edge and write a tutorial for it. You know, that encompasses all the work that that has followed on. You know, after their invention, um, that's what's in the leading edge. Okay, so it's it's really useful for that. <coughs> um, you know, it'll be it'll be lighter on the theory and certainly lighter on the equations than uh, than most geophysics articles. Uh, but the leading edge has more case histories. I mean, there's plenty of case histories in geophysics too. But the leading edge has more case histories. It has, and 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 it's it's the place where you'll find the tutorials. So uh, here's an old tutorial that uh, talks about uh, a little bit about what migration is. And and in the next half of the class, we're going to kind of define what it is. And and uh, and and I'll talk now a little bit about why why we need it. Okay, what it's for, okay, and um, if you've looked at, at seismic data, um, you know these days uh, it's almost always migrated somehow, and there's different varieties of migration. There's, um, uh, of course, you know two D and three D data sets and two D and three D migration. There's post stack and pre stack migration. There's uh, time and depth migration. Okay. And so our job in the in the and, and these are defined right here in this little article. Um, our job here is is going to be to uh, uh, start simple and really find out how to make a migration. Um, uh, of course, we got to understand what what we're trying to do with migration as well, and I'll I'll get to that. But um, we're going to start with two D migration that is post stack. And essentially time migrations. Okay, and I might talk. I might get a chance in this class to talk a little bit about pre-stack migration. I'll talk. I'll mention three D migration uh, another couple of times, and we will see uh, formally the difference between time and depth migration. We'll actually for the the two D post-stack migrations we're doing. We'll actually we'll actually define that formally, and you'll implement it. Um, Okay, so uh, uh, you know we're 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 just starting to understand the basic principles. We're just starting, you know, over here on his table one with the less accurate and less expensive um, uh, procedures, and the uh, uh, you know the whole um, the whole objective is to is to get up to these more accurate and more ex expensive procedures. You know, for which you at least you know once you've got the two D post stack time migration wired, you'll see, <clears throat> and and maybe even in data sets you work on, you'll see where you really need to go to three uh, D pre stack depth migration. Okay. Uh, now here's uh, a little summary diagram that that uh, Liner put in here. Um, let's see. Um, so uh, um, you know, increasing structural complexity, you know, in the in the in the subsurface, you know, you have if you have totally layer cake geology, um, <clears throat> you have uh, uh, you know no complexity. If you have uh, um, Pumpernickel Valley, Central Nevada, okay, you've got extreme structural complexity, okay, and then. <clears throat> um, if you have uh, uh, 
if you have Texas, okay, you don't have much velocity variation, and they're really talking about lateral velocity variation here. And if you have again Pumpernickel Valley, um, um, uh, Soda Lake, uh, Astor Pass, um, Crump Geyser, okay, um, Desert Peak, all right. You're going to have strong velocity variation, especially near the surface. Okay, and so, you know, we are actually uh, Satish and I are actually living in this world right here. We're using pre-stack depth migration, okay, to um, <clears throat> to handle the problems that we have in Nevada with geothermal and oil exploration. Um, I'll be very interested to find out, and and uh, I'm going to bug Tyler, you know. Uh, every couple of months to see what he can tell me about uh, what kind of uh, what kind of processing, what kind of migration you're using on those on those prospects. Those Great, and 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 you know, I, I'm not expecting you'll be able to tell me anything right away, but but when you can, um, I'll, I'll, I'll keep bugging you until you do. That was one of some of my first questions, like, how are you going to process this? Yeah, so yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, so uh, uh, you know we are starting. We're going to learn the ins and outs of post stack time migration right here for the simpler situations with with you know very little velocity variation. Now notice that you can tolerate a lot of velocity variation. You know maybe even some you know the middle of some basins in Nevada if you don't have much structural complexity. If you're just trying to get you know and and really that's what they were after at Soda Lake. Okay. They got a lot of velocity variation, but um, uh, there isn't, uh, you know, until you get to the basin bottom, there isn't a lot of dip. Okay. Now, you know, maybe maybe what really screwed them up was the uh, uh, that that complex basalt body, but above the basalt body, you know, there's virtually no structural complexity. Okay. You got those nice mild faults that are so nicely imaged, because you know they're, uh, let's see. Uh, they're like here, you know. It's not bad, it, and and so the stuff that that uh, that you'll learn, um, you know, in the next few weeks, it applies perfectly well to say imaging that that mudstone. Okay, very nicely applies to it. Um, and uh, I think they did some they did some pre stack time migration, or they did depth migration as well on the P 2 P data. They did. Yeah, so so uh, they probably did time migration, and they're they're trying to um, uh, you know they're trying to get those steeper faults there, and and to you know like image the bas the bottom of the basalt body, right? Okay, but they couldn't do it because you know they tried to do this over here, but really they were you know there in here. Okay, so they really needed to do a, a depth migration, and I I would even argue. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe in Nevada you're we're really always over here, so that uh, you you always need depth migration, and um, and to get any any complex structure you need you need pre stack depth migration. I mean that's that's what I would that's what I would argue. Um, as we'll find out, the uh, the problem with depth migration, the whole the whole barrier to crossing this line. Uh, that's the problem that Satish solved 15 years ago, okay. And <clears throat> at least in Nevada, uh, in the Great Basin, it's really hard to cross that line until you have good information, you have a good characterization, a good tomography, of of good optimization of the lateral velocity variations. Until you have that, you can't cross the line. And and you might as well stay in the simplest stuff and see what you can get, okay? So uh, because you know, um, Satish's methods are are expensive, and so if you don't have any money, then you just got to recognize the limitations of staying in the white area here. Okay, I, I pontificated enough, and we'll continue uh, tomorrow. Okay, so um, what we've got here is a um, a new version of, of Notes 12, where I've put in the, the color images uh, that hopefully will motivate the second part of, of this 706 class. 
Um, and this is an example of uh, uh, among um, you know many um, uh, grand seismological challenges uh, that came out of a <coughs> workshop that NSF convened a few years ago. This is the um, example of, of using seismology to track uh, fl uh, fluids, uh, their history, uh, their potential uh, within the earth. So, um, and of course, mostly we do that in sedimentary basins. And sedimentary basins are faulted, and they have complicated stratigraphy. And essentially, what we need to do is look at, uh, find a way of looking at geometric patterns of the, uh, the reflections within volumes of, of these sedimentary basins. This is actually the uh, F3 data set that you can get associated with OpenDetect. It's, uh, uh, I think, from the Dutch North Sea. Um, there's a bunch of oil production from uh, deep down uh, below the salt. The salt layer is uh, close to the bottom. Uh, slice that's showing here in this sort of uh, um, uh, shadow box view uh, with this uh, included included cube. Uh, you can see evidence of faulting above the salt. Um, you can see uh, uh, not quite in this in this part of the view, but you can see faulting as it appears in horizontal sections. Uh, you can see the dip and strike of stratigraphy. Uh, so there's the uh, there's the dip, there's the strike, um, and then in a few places and and like like right there, and then over on the other side over here, you can see the high amplitudes that are associated with ga gas reservoirs. But other than other than those gas reservoirs and their high amplitudes, the whole game is a game of just properly locating. Where these reflectors are, where they are in the subsurface, you know, you have to be able to collect the, the data that can de define that geometry. So, here you see um, a ship towing uh, almost a kilometer wide array of uh, of sensor um, streamers, and then these uh, big uh, uh, these big fish uh, that are that are being towed out at the edges, and I think there's one over here. Those are towing the air gun arrays at the at the outside of the uh, um, at the outside of the um, uh, of the swath of recording. So uh, this is an attempt to get <coughs> some uh, you know cross line uh, directions of seismic propagation in addition to the long line direction of seismic propagation, uh, which is essential for uh, true. Uh, 3D study. You know the result of the survey depicted on the on the surface here is going to be what I would call a two and a half D uh, uh, or or um, you know not narrow azimuth. You know which would be just purely a bunch of 2D lines put together into a 3D volume, but a uh, a, a uh, and not a wide azimuth uh, seismic survey uh, like they can do on land now, where uh, you basically uh, take a an array of receivers. You know, draped over the landscape, and then you vibrate all through it. So you get you get directions of seismic propagation in all, you know, in all the cardinal directions uh, at the very least. And this is uh, kind of two and a half D because, or or kind of between narrow and wide azimuth, because there are some cross line azimuths, but they're not as representative as the thorough representation of the long line azimuths. So that's uh, uh, that's how it's collected. Uh, you know, in great generality, um, but the the whole reason for it is really not so much. And and what we're going to pay attention to in the in the last half of this class is it's not so much the um, uh, the amplitudes here. It's I mean certainly we want to get the amplitudes above the noise, but then where are they and what is their orientation? Uh, it's all about the geometry and maybe not even the exact. Although we're pretty good at it now. It's not the exact depth or the exact location of the uh, of, of the reflector, but but more important is what is the relative geometry of one reflector to another. That's what's really key here. Now this uh, this process of using relative geometry in three dimensions and the ability to make those horizontal slices. This is a slide from. Um, 
the uh, 755 base analysis course that Trexler and I uh, may, but may are probably not going to be able to teach next semester. Um, during the 90s, um, there was a complete switchover where uh, at the beginning of the 90s, uh, 3D seismic exploration was, uh, you know, just very experimental and, and less than 10 percent, you know, resulted in less than 10 percent of the exploration wells drilled. And 2D seismic, you know, which is traditional and been going on, you know, like uh, since the North Slope of Alaska in the, in the early 60s uh, and even earlier in Texas, uh, you know, the 40s, the 50s, 2D seismic exploration was accounting for um, uh, was accounting for uh, um, about uh, uh, you know eighty ninety percent of the uh, of the expo exploratory wells. Uh, what was the other ten to fifteen percent of the exploratory wells due to? Probably you know gravity, um, um, magnetic, um, geological exploration. Okay, um, you know where people didn't use any seismic and um, they're not actually not saying here, and, and it wouldn't help uh, Brown make his case. <clears throat> wouldn't help Brown make his case um, unless uh, none of those, uh, you know, non-seismic wells uh, uh, were ever producers. So what we got here is is the switchover started in the mid '90s, and you know by the late '90s it was it was entirely switched. So we had, um, you know. Maybe thirty percent of the uh, uh, of the well, okay. Um, uh, I guess that's not a percentage. That's a number of of. Oh, that's a, that's a is that a rate? Okay, maybe thirty percent were being uh, drilled on the basis of three D seismic information, and and the dark ones here, those are the successful ones, you know, versus in white the dry holes. Okay, so. Uh, uh, the um, the success rate was spectacular, okay. Whereas you could see earlier, like in 1991, only 10 percent of all the holes drilled were successful. Um, so uh, that's uh, uh, you know that that drove down the cost of export because uh, you know 3D seismic exploration may be expensive, especially on land. It's quite expensive, but it's nothing. Costs less than 10 percent. Of what drilling wells costs, okay. So particularly what what the three D seismic enabled uh, uh, enabled oil companies to do was to explore in deep water areas and to have confidence that if they drilled a hundred million dollar deep water well, you know, from a from a, a half billion dollar platform, you know, floating out there in, in uh, ten thousand feet of water, uh, that they had a, a decent business case to make. They had a decent chance of success. Okay, so um, here in Nevada, geothermal exploration it still suffers from only a ten percent uh, borehole success rate, and uh, we are applying. Uh, this is uh, these are two D seismics. Uh, uh, you know, really much like the data that uh, that we'll be talking about in um, uh, in this in this half of the class. And um, solving the problems that we have with correctly locating and getting the relative geometry of these reflectors, okay, um, we are uh, uh, well not in this project. This project hasn't been drilled yet. Uh, it's just the most spectacular geologic example that I can find. Um, but uh, there have been uh, some um, geothermal prospects like Hudson Ranch. Where uh, five out of five wells were successful on the basis of 3D seismic. Uh, that's Hudson Ranch is in um, um, uh, is in in the Imperial Valley, southeastern California. Um, so the velocity problems are not quite as bad as they are here in central Nevada, Pumpernickel Valley. Um, but uh, you know, getting any project with a hundred percent drilling success rate is is a real triumph. Um, and uh, and it was uh, it was Optum, by the way, who did the seismic work that that enabled that. Um, you know, and and even um, uh, even in um, uh, in Nevada, uh, some projects that are able to properly use uh, seismic information and locate these uh, 
uh, blind step faults that are at the bottoms of basins, you know, completely. Um, uh, look at the beautiful stratigraphy in the in the alluvial fan here, where you know Trexler and I are looking at this these sorts of images and 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 thinking, wow, we 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 have never known anything about alluvial fan stratigraphy like we see here. You know, we can actually see seismic sequence packages within the alluvial fans, and that's uh, we've never seen that before. And then below the fans, you can see how the fan reflections just go straight over the fault. Um, so it's a uh, earlier tertiary fault. It's not the range front fault, which is the red one. It's uh, inside the basin relative to that. And that's where the uh, geothermal reservoir probably is. There are hot springs right over this spot uh, right here. So uh, you know, we have, um, uh, we have a, a hidden blind fault, which is the geothermal reservoir, which actually is why it has this higher amplitude of reflection, uh, higher porosity. Um, along it, and uh, the uh, geothermal fluids, you know, coming up from that, you know, through the uh, the uh, alluvium from that, have lowered the the velocity a bit. Um, you know, they've kept things, they've kept the cements dissolved, and um, uh, and and that keeps the velocity lower. So, um, uh, you know, we have a whole new paradigm now. You know, after uh, we've been working on this for about twenty years, we have a whole new paradigm. For um, how to explore for geothermal, uh, I at least in Nevada and probably elsewhere in the world, um, and the projects that are that are using it, the companies that are that are honoring it, um, are um, are the ones that are that are still standing. You know, after the recent shakeouts. It, well, I shouldn't use the word shakeout. Uh, after the recent uh, uh, closings of most geothermal companies in in Reno. Um, Here's an example of uh, uh, you know again pseudo you know two and a half D uh, not narrow azimuth not wide azimuth um, seismic imaging at Astor Pass and again we're locating fault planes as uh, direct um, reflections okay and uh, you know without being able to show that the you know the geologists are just aren't going to include it in their models because there's uh, uh, you know Without seeing the fault at the at the surface exposed in outcrop, they're not going to uh, they're not going to include it in their models. But you show them an image like this, and they'll buy into it. And actually, uh, you know, so we we changed the whole Astor Pass model to to include the faults that we found. Uh, another thing that uh, we were able to do is uh, a different fault, which is uh, it's actually uh, this one, uh, but shown on a different section that you can't see in this image. Um, it shows up within 27 meters of where we interpreted uh, in in the in the in the fault gouge in this borehole shows up within 27 meters of the depth that we interpreted it would be from the seismic data. Okay, so that's another that's another reason that we're able to uh, <coughs> um, we're able to now um, uh, do a lot more with um, um, with seismic and, and geothermal. Um, here's a uh, um, here's a, a recent t discovery. Uh, this is a uh, seismic image which properly locates a uh, a fault. There's other things. You know, there's a basin in here, and you can see the velocity image. Uh, and there's a fault which you can track down here. They have a bunch of uh, shallow wells. This is at Oregon Institute of Technology in Klamath Falls that tap into the upper level of that fault. Given this image and being able to track the fault down further, okay, they really wanted to drill here, but uh, that was actually too far off the. Uh, uh, it was going to be too. It was not in uh, OIT's budget, so that's still an untapped reservoir probably. Uh, they also wanted to drill here, but uh, that's off the OIT property. <coughs> so um, uh, they um, they drilled in. Um, and uh, they knew where, the, where they expected to hit the fault. So um, they, uh, uh, when the drillers thought they were getting close, you know, in the image, in the seismic image, to where the fault is, then they, they stopped overbalancing the mud, and they, started, they used a lighter mud. Okay? Then when they hit the fault, it was more porous, and they hit it within 50 feet of where the seismic image uh, predicted it would be. Okay, um, so when they hit the fault, 
all of the, oh, you know, we didn't get a whole bunch of, uh, I don't know what it is, $10 a gallon overbalanced mud, you know, flooding the fault zone. That can also seal off the geothermal reservoir, okay? So, uh, uh, you know, this, this seismic technology has proved to be uh, a real asset also in, uh, in just the, the engineering of the wells, okay? Um, <clears throat> so the drillers switched to a lighter mud, and they only had to go 50 feet, and they hit the fault. Um, they uh, uh, they had you know they had they had some prediction of, of what the pressure would be within the fault zone. You know, not too high, so they they were able to meet it at balance. And then they drilled along the fault zone. They actually were able to deviate the well and drill along the fault zone. So now this well is providing 60 percent of the campus electrical needs. Uh, it's not a huge success, but uh, you know, at least for that project, uh, a relative success. <clears throat> so, so you know, we're <clears throat> what are we talking about here? You know, we're 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 not talking about um, getting. I'm not talking about even deriving the reflection coefficients along these faults. Okay, I'm just talking about. Okay, you got to have enough of a ref reflection coefficient that you can see it. And then the big question is, where is it? Where is it relative to the other structures? Okay, so it's a purely geometric imaging problem. Now here's a little more uh, 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 otherworldly uh, geometric imaging problem. There's a <clears throat> I highly recommend uh, if you're if you're traveling on 70 um, between uh, Interstate 15 and Denver, <clears throat> I highly recommend. Uh, driving uh, a couple hours south of uh, Green River, uh, Utah, and going down to the northern end of Canyonlands National Park, where you can drive into uh, a picnic area um, that is uh, um, uh, right here at the edge of this uh, structure called Upheaval Dome. And um, it, uh, it, I should have put a picture in, actually. It looks like you know it kind of erupted. It, it looks like it ought to be a salt dome, because uh, what's at the bottom of the central depression is uh, uh, sandstone. I can't remember the name of the sandstone. There's a sandstone at the, at the in the bottom of the central depression, which is two thousand feet higher than it should be in the you know otherwise flat stratigraphy of the uh, <coughs> of of the uh, uh, of the Colorado Plateau in this area, so uh, uh, you know there's there's kind of a mystery there. Something has caused it to to rise. Um, and back in '95, uh, uh, some students and I did uh, a couple of of uh, not shallow, but but um, you know essentially small high resolution size and reflection lines, uh, just trying to see what the stratigraphy is and where the faults are. Underneath this uh, this dome, we were able to correlate with this exploration well that was drilled um, into the ring syncline. Uh, you know, actually, of course, hoping to hit the uh, fringes of the salt dome, um, and and did not hit any any salt dome or anything like it. Um, stayed in a stayed in a syncline, but that's one of the things that was done in the '60s back uh, back before they made Canyonlands a national park. Um, and then there's another exploration well out here, which we could correlate to. So here's a standard, you know, cross section for kind of a standard non-piercement type salt dome. And um, uh, oh, it's the uh, Cutler that's uh, that's too high uh, and, and exposed up there in the Central Depression. The Green River is out here, um, and this part of of uh, Canyonlands is called Island in the Sky. Uh, for when you go there, uh, so uh, you know the salt bulges up in the middle, and it it you know the salt flows away from a moat outside, okay. And so when you make your balanced cross sections for that mechanism, then uh, you should see you know these uh, 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 you should have these depths. The moat should uh, um, should actually increase in, in amplitude as you go down. And in this Buck Mesa well, uh, you can find uh, a good match here, you know, which is right where that model says it should be. But then uh, you don't find these formations 
at the, uh, at the depths that's predicted by this non-Pierceman dome model. You can make a, uh, a Pierceman dome model, <coughs> um, which uh, uh, you know, would have to dr drain a whole lot more salt, so it makes a much wider moat. And in that case, you can match the uh, uh, you can make a section that will that will match the uh, the tops of the of the stratigraphy in the in the borehole. Um, and uh, but still, the uh, you know you should have drained this moat. And uh, it's also kind of strange that uh, you know some very good geologists have spent a lot of time walking around the Central Depression, and they've never seen any scrap of of paradox or uh, or Hermosa uh, in there at all. Okay, you would think that something would get left behind, but uh, you know the, the the geologists who have who have this pinched off salt diaper uh, 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 hypothesis don't think that it, that that fact kills their hypothesis. And here's the uh, the hypothesis that that we believe uh, that it was a uh, you know basically a force from above, not a force from below. So instead of having uh, increasing deformation with depth, you have decreasing deformation with depth. And essentially, um, you have uh, very little uh, deformation. In fact, it appears to us that there's a kind of an anti-deformation in the, uh, uh, and the, these gray areas are the areas that the, seis that the seismic sections imaged. And so, so you know, here again, it's, a, it's purely a question of geometry. How deep are these, are these formation tops? Okay. Uh, and that you know that's what solved the whole problem, uh, and and that's why um, uh, you know that's why we were able to negate the uh, the salt diaper, um, because we did not see we did not see this geometry at the edge of the moat. There should have been the edge of the moat in this in the paradox salt uh, visible within our sections. We did not see it, uh, so we were able to in our in our minds at least uh, negate the. Uh, the salt diaper hypothesis, which left the impact hypothesis about a hundred meter um, uh, meteor, uh, maybe a, if it was a ball of ice like a comet, uh, maybe a half kilometer, uh, probably hit right about the time of the KT boundary. Although this is much too small to have caused any disturbance to the biosphere uh, globally, um, and, and of course they found the KT boundary. Uh, 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 now I forget the name of the of the giant you know relic crater in Yucatan, northern Yucatan. Um, so that's the KT boundary impact. But uh, about 90 million years ago, there was also this uh, um, this upheaval dome impact. Um, and actually, uh, uh, nearby in Arches National Park, uh, you can see uh, you know from the sediments being. Uh, uh, being deposited at that time, you can, those are now preserved in the rock, and you can see uh, clastic dikes, dikes, and what are what are called seismites, you know, um, um, soft sediment that's been deformed by seismic shaking. Um, there's a paper by uh, uh, by Alvarez, the the geologist Alvarez, uh, in that um, uh, about ten years ago. Um, so uh, uh, quite a uh, quite a lot of evidence, and then uh, finally they discovered shot quartz in here, so that that clinched it, of course. So we start out with a, uh, uh, and and you've seen this before. We start out with a geometrical question, okay, and uh, you know why why can't we image right to the edge of the section? This is the intersection. There's the where the well is. You know why can't we image to the edge of the section? Why why do we have the reflectors turning up? You're going to find out a lot about that. You know, so that's why we didn't follow them when we were uh, when we were um, uh, completing our uh, 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 when we were doing our interpretation. Uh, Zakir Kanber and I um, we had uh, this uh, sonic log, which I uh, with with that uh, filtering trick I transformed into a reflection. You know, one one trace of a reflection section, and it's in depth. And this is a depth. This is a pre-stack depth migration, actually. Um, and here's uh, here's that step in the Hermosa, right in the ring syncline, okay, um, where uh, where the Hermosa is higher than it ought to be. And and you know, we can correlate reflections on the basis of their relative uh, strength and their kind of um, 
um, their uh, uh, their relative uh, frequency, if you like. You know, so it's clear that the top of the paradox is is not as strong a, a reflector as is this uh, these mud stringers, these stringers of mud and um, uh, I mean, look at how small the sonic transit time is on the on the edges of the mud stringers. Uh, they're um, they're mud encased in anhydrite, which is encased in salt, and and that's uh, that gives these wild swings in uh, sonic transit time, which tr which ca translates to a, a strong reflection. Okay, so we could identify for sure that this is the uh, you know, and our section is within a hundred meters or so of this well. So uh, you know that for sure is the top of the paradox, not this. Okay, uh, and and this is all you know. Th now the section up here is uh, is heavily faulted. We might be imaging some of the faults. We might not be. Um, and uh, there are huge uh, you know disturbances in the stratigraphy as you get closer to the central depression. Um, and then the, the overall. Uh, uh, you know, stratigraph. There's a there's a fault that's identified. The overall stratigraphic uh, um, disturbance, you know, lessens as you go down. And uh, so that was uh, one piece of evidence. Okay. Uh, here's a here's a kind of strange uh, case. Um, I used to do a lot of work on uh, deep crustal reflections, and uh, this is a uh, a section. Uh, of of several lines, you know, actually covering a huge area. Uh, let's see, is there? A, yeah, there's a horizontal scale, only 20 kilometers there. This is where the San Andreas Fault meets the Garlock Fault in Southern California, kind of a, a northwestward oblique view. You know, Reno is is way up here, um, and um, uh, now at uh, about 10 seconds two-way travel time. That's uh, about 35 kilometers depth. So uh, this uh, NSF-sponsored uh, consortium for continental uh, reflection profiling um, survey, uh, essentially done out of Cornell University, they found uh, these reflectors that basically ended at the Moho. You know, there could be reflections above the Moho, but uh, when you get below the Moho, there's many fewer. Uh, so they're able to locate the the crust mantle boundary. Okay, and uh, Interestingly enough, it's uh, uh, in many places of the Great Basin uh, and in the Mojave, it's remarkably flat, um, which uh, led the Cornell people to speculate that it's uh, um, that the Moho is, is an active tectonic boundary, like a fault. Um, you know, essentially a detachment fault. Uh, but one of the uh, features. Uh, uh, okay, there's one feature that does daylight. It's called the RAN thrust. It's uh, it's like an ancient um, and now exposed uh, um, uh, plate interface, uh, you know, of a downgoing plate. So below it, you have schists uh, from from some, you know, earlier than Laramide uh, subduction interval. That's now been all uh, you know tilted and faulted up, um, and so they can they can. You know, trace the ran thrust for the surface, so they think they know what what this reflect reflection A is. But what are these things that are uh, you know that are deeper, like this uh, F? Yeah, this reflection F here and this B and G. What are those? So they 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 they, uh, they just looked at the geometry. Okay, you know the, you you might notice this flat and ramp and flat and ramp and flat. And so just on the basis of that geometry, they speculated these could be uh, buried thrust faults, which there's plenty. You know, you, you've got from the Sonoma on, orogeny on on up. You know, there's the Southern California has experienced you know 20 orogenies, so you can um, uh, you can assign it to anyone you want. Um, so that's that's plenty believable in this area, <coughs> and um, um, you know maybe this is a laramide structure, perhaps. Um, you know, it's it's deeper, which probably means it's younger. Uh, strangely enough, you got the oldest rocks at the surface, the oldest faults at the surface, and maybe younger ones down below. You know, so the surface is active in in certain ways, and the moho is active. So you get this kind of inverted uh, stratigraphy, if you like. You know, the youngest faults maybe uh, the deepest ones. 
but again, just geometry and just relative geometry. You know, the, the CoCorp survey, their analysis, you know, they said all this without, you know, they, they have 20% uncertainties on the depths of these. They've got probably larger uncertainty than that on the, uh, on the location. Um, you know, it's, it's really just relative geometry. OK. So speaking of relative geometry, um, what are we going to be fighting when we, uh, when we try to do that? OK. So um, OK, down at the, the bottom left, all right, that is a zero offset data set. So uh, say from uh, a chirp data set, the lower left would be the best you would ever see. Okay, that is a perfect data set, and, and of course I created this in a, you know, using a modeling code, a wave a wave equation modeling code, and there's no noise as you can tell. So um, there's a there's a basin here, and the basin has walls. Uh, the south wall is steep, and the north wall is um, uh, is it, I think, 45 or 60 degrees, maybe. Um, and there's a basin floor that's flat. <clears throat> and I didn't bother to put any stratigraphy in the basin uh, to further confuse things. So, so uh, here's what we're going to talk about in this class. We're going to go from this section here, which is, which is our data, okay, and could be the result of a, of a chirp experiment, to the section to its right, okay, and the section to the right uh, has ha is is called migrated. And we're going to find out what migration means, but here's what what it does, okay. Migration has has taken the this wave field, okay. This is a, a wave field. You know, there's uh, I don't know, I forget what a hundred, um, maybe just fifty uh, sensors across the surface. <clears throat> and um, and each of them records a seismogram, and that's what you, and that's what you see hanging down. You can see some of those little strips of, of seismograms. So that's a wave field. You know, it's uh, it's uh, waveforms recorded in time by an array, and it makes it t it turns the wave field into a uh, a cross section. Now the cross section is still plotted in time. Okay. Um, but uh, we should be able to multiply um, uh, the time by the velocity and get the get the depth. So really, just a relabeling of the axis, you know, like we did in the reflection lab uh, uh, in in my uh, six ninety two class. You know that that should be all that's necessary to convert this into a section. But what you can see is is what migration has done is it has corrected the relative geometry. Okay, it's actually made this corner at the north end of the of the flat basin floor. It's made it it's made it intersect. It's made it a closed corner. Okay, you can see in the wave field uh, that's not true. Okay, that doesn't happen. Also, you can see that that where there are um, uh, interfaces that are cut off by the very steep southern side of the of the basin. Okay, each of those each of those things forms a diffraction, and especially the <clears throat> the edge of the the edge of the basin here on the right, uh, on the south side, you know, against this steep wall, that edge, that that truncation, forms this very strong diffraction down here in the wave field. What migration does is it has it has reconstructed, it has reconstructed and collapsed that diffraction all to there. Right to the corner. Okay, you can see it doesn't do it perfectly, you know, but but uh, you know, in this ideal case, you know, this is as good as it's ever going to get. Okay, uh, <clears throat> there are other things here. Uh, there is actually another reflector down here, uh, but even after migration, it's all it's all uh, skewed by the um, um, by the uh, the velocity changes that are <clears throat> that are in here. Um, there are multiple reflections in here, and those are, you know, they're not located at their actual reflector. They're located somewhere else, you know, usually deeper. Now, um, the perfect chirp data 
uh, is is here, and you know with chirp we can get actual zero offset data, right? In the in the chirp fish, the uh, the source transducer is less than a meter from the receiver transducer. Okay, or even there's a little array, you know, maybe about a meter long in the fish, uh, in the chirp fish that uh, uh, that uh, uh, is the the receiver transducer. Okay. <clears throat> So that's so the you know compared to the depths the offset is zero between the source and receiver. On land, you know our zero offset data look, you know, don't look like data. They're just completely dominated by the uh, on land the zero offset data are completely dominated by uh, near source uh, surface waves and reverberations in the soil. We can't see any reflections in in the. Uh, in the near source, you know, unless we're in an ideal environment. Okay, so so um, this is a uh, this is a, a stack section. This is the best we're going to get out of land data. Okay, and um, uh, that's uh, you know that shows some of the some of the things that that are in the whole section. There's a there isn't much of the dipping reflector, but there is some. It's in the same place. Uh, the diffraction from the south end of the um, of the flat basin bottom um, is kind of weak, but it's there. Uh, the diffractions from the steep wall are not really there. Um, so uh, that's the best we're going to get from land data, where we don't have good zero offset. Now the um, um, I'm going to touch on it a little bit, but uh, the objective in in um, in 757 is to work on this. Uh, um, no, I'm sorry. Uh, so for land data, here's uh, here's what we'll get. Okay, um, this is now the migrated stack. Okay, so for land data, we we get the uh, stack section, and then we can migrate that using exactly the same transformation as from lower left to lower right. So going from upper left to upper right, this is this is the best we can get. You could see that that importantly the relative geometry between the north basin wall and the the basin floor that's kind of represented there. There's an artifact, you know, we, we don't fully recover the edge of the the south edge of the basin floor, right? There's a bit of an artifact there, uh, but we're also not suffering from uh, Notice that that this thing is like totally gone. Uh, it's just too weak to be uh, to be represented. So uh, uh, you know this is what we'll be able to do at the end of this part of the class. You you'll be able to take either uh, you know perfect zero offset data like chirp data, or or uh, you'll take a result from you know somebody who's worked on stacking uh, a landline, and you'll be able to turn it into a cross section. Okay, wave fields on the left. Cross section on the right after migration. And I better stop there.